All right. This morning we're going to talk about the coming military dictatorship. Or I should maybe say the coming military dictatorships, plural, uh, because there are two of them coming. And um, there's a lot of scripture here I want to cover. And a lot of it, <clears throat> for sake of time, we're just we're not going to be able to go to it. So um, I did a message a number of weeks ago on Satan, on who he is, where he came from, where he's going. And there's one thing I left out, which is very important. And the um, first time really I heard about this was a message by uh, Dr. Peter Ruckman on the Mark of the Beast. And he talked about how Satan will always counterfeit what the Lord is doing. So I just want to look at a couple of these real quick here. Like I said, we're not going to turn to these. I'll just give you the scripture. You can look them up some other time. But I'll just give you a couple examples of where the Lord does something or appears a certain way and Satan will counterfeit it. Uh, first of all, you have Jesus is called the angel of God in Acts chapter 27, verse 23. And Paul says, whose I am and who I serve or whom I serve. So uh, Jesus appears as an angel. Okay. And 2 Corinthians eleven fourteen, Satan appears as an angel. So you have both of them being called an angel. It's very interesting. Number two, Jesus is compared to a serpent in John three fourteen. Okay, and as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. And now, if you remember the Old Testament story, you can look that up, but basically Moses lifted up a serpent and the people had to look to it to be healed. Well, same thing with Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ was lifted up on the cross, and you have to look to him to be saved. But Satan, uh, if you know anything at all about the Bible, Satan is called a serpent numerous times. Genesis chapter 3, verse 1, of course, is the first reference to that. You know, the serpent is more subtle and, and everything. So Jesus is called, compared to a serpent, Satan is a serpent. Number three, Jesus Christ has a bride. Revelation 19, verses 7 through 9, which is a city. Revelation 21, verse 2. So Jesus has a bride, which is, if you're saved, you're part of that bride. And we are uh, said to be a city, too, New Jerusalem. Satan has a bride. Revelation chapter 17 talks about Babylon, mystery Babylon, which is also a city. Revelation 17, verse 18. Okay, Jesus is God manifest in the flesh. Capital G, God. Satan is called the God of this world in 2 Corinthians 4.4. 4. So they're both called God, spelled differently. And that's important. <laughs> okay, number five, Jesus is a king in Revelation 19.16. We'll get to that a little bit later. King of kings and Lord of lords. Satan is called a king over all the children of pride in Job 41 verse 34. Okay, so they're both called kings. Jesus is a Christ. I think we all know that. Okay, Satan is an anti-Christ. And it's interesting, Acts 4.26 says, The kings of the earth stood up and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against his Christ. Why would it say his Christ about the Lord? Because Satan also has a Christ. And we'll see that in this study. Uh, Jesus is called anointed in Psalm 2.2. 2. Satan is called the anointed cherub in Ezekiel 28.14. Jesus is the light of the world in John 8, 12. Satan appears as an angel of light in 2 Corinthians eleven fourteen. So they both are compared to light there. Uh, Jesus is called the lion of the tribe of Judah in Revelation 5, 5. Satan is compared to a roaring lion in uh, 1 Peter 5, 8. Number 10. Jesus comes to the earth on a white horse. Revelation 19, 11 through 21. Satan, in the form of the Antichrist, and we'll get into that, like I said, a little bit later, shows up in Revelation 6, 1 through 2 on a white horse. By the way, the uh, Council on Foreign Relations, their symbol is a man on a white horse. Okay? Uh, not going to get into that subject right now. But it's interesting, too, because you look in a lot of Bible commentaries and a lot of the universities, Bible colleges now, are teaching that Revelation 6, the rider on the white horse, and Revelation 19, the rider on the white horse, are the same. 
And I've run into that. We had people at, at the one church where we used to go to that believed that way. That they're the same rider. They're not. And I mean, just, just read the plain English. The one has a crown. The one has, Jesus has many crowns. The Antichrist comes with a bow. Jesus comes with a sword. They're not the same. Okay, and read the context too. I mean, it's just, it's incredible how they could be deceived on that. Number 11, just have a couple more here and then we'll get into the message. But number 11, Jesus seals 144,000 Jews in their foreheads. Revelation 7, verses 3 through 8. Satan seals his followers in their foreheads. Revelation 13, 16 through 18. So again, Satan always is counterfeiting what Jesus Christ does. Uh, Jesus has a holy Bible, which he commands his servants, his followers, to preserve. Matthew 24, verse 35 says, Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words shall not pass away. Jesus Christ says, These are my words. I exalt or I magnify them above my name. Preserve them. Keep them. Don't change them. And his followers are very careful about not changing the word of God. Now, Satan, he also uses scripture. He'll quote scripture. But uh, it says in Mark 4, 15, And these are they by the wayside where the word is sown, but when they have heard, Satan cometh immediately and taketh away the word that was sown in their hearts. Satan's main purpose is confusion, lies. Now thy word, John seventeen seventeen says, Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. So what would be the number one thing that Satan would attack? God's Word. And what's the best way to do it? Counterfeit it. Bring out false versions. Okay? Again, you can listen to the Bible believing. What is a Bible believer message if you want more on that? And finally, Jesus will physically rule this earth. Listen to the premillennial message for that. And Satan will physically rule this earth. And actually, if you want to be technical, he is in charge. He's been given the power right now. On this earth. Revelation 13. Uh, we'll be getting into that a little bit later. Okay, now first we're going to look at when Satan is really going to get to run the thing. Revelation chapter 6. We're going to go to Revelation chapter 6 and we're going to see when this military police state is really going to take over. Revelation chapter 6, verses 1 through 11. We're going to read that quickly here. This is this has not happened yet. This is not figurative. It's not symbolic. It is literal. And it's coming. Okay, Revelation chapter 6. And I saw when the Lamb opened one of the seals, and I heard, as it were, the noise of thunder, one of the four beasts saying, Come and see. And I saw, and behold, a white horse, and he that sat on him had a bow, and a crown was given unto him, and he went forth conquering and to conquer. It sounds like military to me, doesn't it? Uh, verse 3, And when he had opened the second seal, I heard the second beast say, Come and see. And there went out another horse that was red, and power was given to him that sat thereon to take peace from the earth, and that they should kill one another. And there was given unto him a great sword. Again, you have war. Verse 5, And when he had opened the third seal, I heard the third beast say, Come and see, and behold, and lo, a black horse, and he that sat on him had a pair of balances in his hand. And I heard a voice in the midst of the four beasts say, A measure of wheat for a penny, and three measures of barley for a penny, and see thou hurt not the oil and the wine. You know what happens when a country has war? Their ability to produce food is diminished. Obviously, things are blown up. Well, you say the Bible's not scientific. Yes, it is. You have a conqueror, you have war, and it follows with famine. And you're going to see what happens next. Verse 7, And when he had opened the fourth seal, I heard the voice of the fourth beast say, Come and see. And I looked, and behold, a pale horse, and his name that sat on him was Death, and hell followed with him. And power was given unto him, unto them over the fourth part of the earth to kill with sword and with hunger and with death and with the beasts of the earth. Isn't that something? So you have the famine and then you have death and hell coming after that. 
That's scientific. And that's your future, by the way, if you're not saved. <laughs> okay. Oh, we're heading for a time of peace. No, we're not. <laughs> no, I don't think so. Verse 9. And when he had opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of them that were slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they held. Let me just stop there for another for just a second. How could these people be slain for the word of God? This is after the rapture. This is in the time of Jacob's trouble. How could they be slain for the word of God if the word of God was lost with the original autographs? The word of God is available today. King James Bible. And this Bible is already banned in certain countries. This Bible is considered hate literature by many people. And it's going to eventually lead to them being executed. Verse 10. And they cried with a loud voice, saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, dost thou not judge and avenge our blood on them that dwell on the earth? And white robes were given unto every one of them, and it was said unto them that they should rest yet for a little season until their fellow servants also and their brethren that should be killed as they were should be fulfilled. A lot of killing coming up. A lot of death. A lot of misery. Yeah. Okay, you cannot rule the world without military power. You're not ever going to have a, a time when we can all just get together and just talk out our differences and then we'll have a one-world government. No. Uh, I think it was David Rockefeller said the one time, we will have a one-world government whether by conquest or consent. And it's going to be conquest. Why? The Bible says so. <laughs> okay, um, Matthew 24, verse 22 says, And except those days should be shortened, there should no flesh be saved. But for the elect's sake, those days shall be shortened. You know, we don't really realize the times that we live in. The 20th century, a lot of people in America would think that it was probably one of the best centuries ever, and yet it was the bloodiest century in human history. It was over, I mean, our own government's figures are over 150 million people killed as a result, result of war in the 20th century. It's amazing. And how's the 21st century doing? We're already in war. You know, it's not going to get any better. And God is actually going to have to supernaturally uh, shorten the days of this time period coming up so that some flesh can be saved. That's how bad it's going to be. Okay. Um, I was going to play this recording, but for sake of time, I'm not going to. Um, but you can look it up online. Uh, the farewell address of... Eisenhower in January of 1961. And in that address, he warns about misplaced power and the military-industrial complex. He warns about that thing. Now, why would he warn about that? Well, it's kind of interesting because who was the next president in? Kennedy. Kennedy. Now, Kennedy, if you study the thing, and I'm not going to go off on a big tangent here, but if you study the thing, Kennedy started to do some things that were not real popular with this military-industrial complex. He started to fire members of the CIA. He started to go after the Federal Reserve. This, To just explain what the military-industrial complex is, it's the people who want war so they can make money off of it. Okay, War is a great way to make a lot of money. The industry, there's a lot of different industries that you can just get rich off of. Okay? They wanted Kennedy to start an invasion on Cuba. The whole Bay of Pigs thing. And that and that just, he messed it all up. He didn't want to go to war with Cuba. And like I said, there's a lot more I get into, but I'm not going to. And Kennedy started to disobey this military-industrial complex. And what did they do? They killed him. Killed him in front of thousands of eyewitnesses now let me just say this there's a lot of talk we got to stop we got to stop the military police state from coming in we got to stop this this one world government movement we got to st you think you're going to stop them they were able to kill a president in broad daylight in front of thousands of eyewitnesses and get away with it and you're going to stop them wrong <laughs> you're not going to stop them and even if the bible didn't prophesy okay the bible says this stuff's coming Okay, But even if the Bible didn't say it, you're still not going to stop them. They're too firmly entrenched. They're too powerful. You're not going to do it. And as a Christian, that's not really to be your goal anyhow. That's right. 
Okay. Uh, it's interesting too. I just want to say this as kind of a side note. Um, it came out that John Kerry uh, has made over three million dollars from the war in Iraq. <laughs> <laughs> you know, a lot of these liberals, you know, the, I'm against the war. Uh, you know, uh-huh. No, they're not. They're part of the military industrial complex. They're making a lot of money. This liberal lunatic, uh, Michael Moore, he's also um, has stock in Halliburton. <laughs> and he's making millions of dollars. These people, they're, they're hypocrites, okay? Whatever. Um you know, and there's a lot of things that you get into. I know there's a lot of stuff on the internet. A lot of people get sidetracked in this. They get very fearful of what's coming. And some of it's very scary. But hey, don't get sidetracked on that stuff. There's nothing you can do about it anyhow. You know, nothing. And um, and let me tell you something, too. The best way to fight tyranny is not by writing your congressman or joining a militia or any of that stuff. It's by staying in this book. Yeah, that's right. I mean, you look through this Bible here, and why didn't God destroy, or what, what was the condition that God said, I won't destroy Sodom and Gomorrah, if you can find me ten righteous men? Mm-hmm. Why hasn't God destroyed America yet? Because there's more than ten righteous men here. There's a good, strong core of Bible-believing Christians here in America that are still trying to get the work done. That's what we need to do. That's how the Lord will preserve things. That's how the Lord will keep us safe. And the more and more Christians that back off and say, well, you know, the Catholic Church isn't so bad. The new versions aren't so bad. The, the modern rock music isn't so bad. The more people that do that, the more God's judgment is going to come down on this nation. My hope, my prayer, is that we can remain true to God's Word to such a level that God eventually has to say, okay, my plan is going to be fulfilled at the time of Jacob's trouble. And I will keep judgment away from the Christians. And I will rapture them out at some point. Okay. Is that going to happen? I can't, I can't guarantee that. We might have to see some hard times in America. I don't know. But the way to fight it is to stay in the book and to keep doing the work of the Lord. Okay. Uh... I could spend a lot of time on that, but Revelation 13, verse 1 through 9. We're going to see a little bit more detail here about this kingdom that's coming, this military kingdom. Okay, Revelation 13, verse 1. And I stood upon the sand of the sea and saw a beast rise up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, and upon his horns ten crowns, and upon his heads the name of blasphemy. And the beast which I saw was like unto a leopard, and his feet were as the feet of a bear, and his mouth as the mouth of a lion, and the dragon gave him his power, and his seat, and great authority. Who's the dragon? Satan. Satan gives him his power, his seat, and great authority. Verse 3, And I saw one of his heads as it were wounded to death, and his deadly wound was healed, and all the world wondered after the beast. And they worshiped the dragon which gave power unto the beast. And they worshiped the beast, saying, Who is like unto the beast, who is able to make war with him? And there was given unto him a mouth, speaking great things and blasphemies. And power was given unto him to continue forty and two months. And he opened his mouth in blasphemy against God to blaspheme his name and his tabernacle and them that dwell in heaven. And it was given unto him to make war with the saints and to overcome them. And power was given him over all kindreds and tongues and nations. And all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him whose names are not written in the book of life of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. If any man have an ear, let him hear. Will there be a one world dictatorship? Yes. And it will be brought in with military power. Okay. Now, I've talked about this in other studies. You go back to the book of Daniel, and it says about that this king will come in peaceably and obtain the kingdom by flatteries. By peace he shall destroy many, it says another part. We're not going to go there. But if you want to see that thing worked out today, a good example, check out the UN peacekeeping forces, what they do when they go into a country. Okay, peace is an excuse for war, essentially. 
we want to have peace, but first we have to destroy these people here. <laughs> you know, And that's what the Antichrist is going to be doing. He's going to be a man of war. He's a conqueror. The red horse follows him. You know, war. But he's going to come in peaceably. He's going to come in and say, I want world peace. But we have this threat of terrorism. And we have to destroy these certain types of people. And the people that are going to be... It's its interesting how after 9-11 it was Islam, Islam, Islam is, is bad. Now all of a sudden it's, well, Islam's kind of a religion of peace. Just don't make them mad because then they're not peaceful. <laughs> you know, but now it's it's shifting away from Islam and kind of going over to Christianity all of a sudden. You know, it's interesting. And, <clears throat> of course, by the time you hit the tribulation, it's going to be, they're going to be focused on Israel, on the Jews. Not at first, maybe. At first, there's going to be some talk of peace there. But Bible belief and then, of course, you know, the Jews in that time period, they're going to be the ones that are attacked and they're going to go after them. So it'll be a, a very, very bad time. But now it's said there in um, uh, verse 4, who is able to make war with him? Who is like unto the beast? Who is able to make war with him? <clears throat> and there's so much I could get into the, on this thing. Revelation 19, go there next. There are so many things that you could talk about in this. Uh, this is just a basic sermon. Um, again, you know, as you're doing studies for this type of thing, there's just huge amounts of scripture i'm just trying to kind of boil it down here but revelation 19 verse 19 <coughs> through 21 <coughs> it says <coughs> man my voice is going <coughs> no i'm all right and i saw the beast and the kings of the earth and their armies gathered together to make war against him that sat on the horse and against his army and the beast was taken and with him the false prophet they wrought miracles before him, and which, with which he deceived them that had received the mark of the beast, and then that worshipped his image. These both were cast alive into a lake of fire burning with brimstone, and the remnant were slain with the sword of him that sat upon the horse, which sword proceeded out of his, his mouth, and all the fowls were filled with their flesh. <clears throat> when Jesus Christ comes back, it will be settled with war. Now, we see from the Bible that there is a military dictatorship coming up headed by the Antichrist. Again, it's Satan counterfeiting what the Lord is going to do. And we're going to see the second military dictatorship. Okay, we see the first one. Who is like unto the beast? Who is able to make war with him? Jesus Christ is. He comes back destroys the Antichrist, and wipes out his whole entire army. But then what is set up after that? See, a lot of people are deceived into thinking that it's just going to be this beautiful time of peace and everybody's going to get along at that point. How is Jesus Christ going to set up his kingdom? How is he going to run things? With a rod of iron. With a rod of iron. And we're going to see that. <clears throat> okay, so you have... Jesus Christ wipes out the Antichrist and his army. Now what happens next? Matthew chapter 25. I'm going to show you some things here that you're just not going to hear from the average uh, preacher. Matthew chapter 25. And it's not, I'm, um, I'm not trying to build myself up or I'm special or something like that. Uh, that's not it at all. I'm just saying this is stuff a lot of people just don't want to hear. Um, Matthew chapter 25, verse 31. <clears throat> it says here, When the Son of Man shall come in His glory, and all the holy angels with Him, that's you if you're a saint right now, if you're a Christian, then shall He sit upon the throne of His glory, and before Him shall be gathered all nations, and He shall separate them one from another, as a shepherd divideth his sheep from the goats. And he shall set the sheep on his right hand, but the goats on the left. Then shall the king say unto them on the right hand, Come ye blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. Now, if I threw a bunch of, you know, like they do at a fair, they throw candy out onto the ground. If I said to the children, now gather it up, what do they have to do? Do they just sit there and the candy comes to them? 
No. <laughs> they have to run out there and they have to get it. They have to gather it. When Jesus Christ comes back, does he just sit there and say, okay, all nations come to me? They're not going to do it. <laughs> if you read back in Revelation, the kings and stuff and a lot of the rulers are hiding in in the mountains and, and under the ground, basically, and they're crying for the rocks to fall on them and to hide them from the Lamb, from Jesus Christ when he comes back. And I'm going to show you exactly what happens, how this how the nations are gathered. Turn to Joel. Joel chapter 2. This is kind of interesting because you have a a prophecy concerning this army, the army of the Lord, which read Revelation 19. After the marriage supper of the Lamb, we are we come back with Jesus Christ as his army. Okay, Joel chapter 2, verse 1. Blow ye the trumpet in Zion, and sound an alarm in my holy mountain. Let all the inhabitants of the land tremble, for the day of the Lord cometh, for it is nigh at hand. A day of darkness and of gloominess, a day of clouds and of thick darkness, as the morning spread upon the mountains. A great people and a strong, there hath not been ever the like, neither shall be any more after it, even to the years of many generations." Resurrected saints with glorified bodies made after the image of Jesus Christ coming back. Okay? There's never been anybody like that coming down to this earth. Now look at verse 3. A fire devoureth before them, and behind them a flame burneth. The land is as the Garden of Eden before them, and behind them a desolate wilderness. Yea, and nothing shall escape them. You know, I was driving up to Lebanon uh, the other day, out running some errands, and I went past this adult bookstore. And I thought, boy, there's some way I wish I could close something like that down. Just filthy, just ruining people's lives. Even just a simple thing of the women that get into that and they're posing and stuff. It just ruins them, you know. Man, I wish I could do something about that. And it was kind of like the Lord kind of said, well, someday... <laughs> You see, when we come back down and, and the nations are being gathered, what do you think is going to happen to the bars and the strip clubs and the adult bookstores and these pagan churches and things? Do you think we're just going to let them stand? Do you think the Lord Jesus Christ ruling physically on the earth with us, you know, carrying out his laws, do you think he's just going to say, well, that's their right, they have a right to... uh uh They're going to be burned. You just saw it there in Joel. A fire devoureth before them. Okay, verse 4. The appearance of them is as the appearance of horses, and as horsemen, so shall they run. We aren't horses when we come back, or half horse, half man. Horsemen. Right there, we're riding horses. Read Revelation 19. Okay. Like the noise of chariots on the tops of mountains shall they leap, like the noise of a flame of fire that devoureth the stubble as a strong people set in battle array. Before their face the people shall be much pained, all faces shall gather blackness. They shall run like mighty men, they shall climb the wall like men of war, and they shall march every one on his ways, and they shall not break their ranks. Onward, Christian soldiers. <laughs> it's going to be great. Um, verse 8, Neither shall one thrust another, they shall walk every one in his path, and when they fall upon the sword, they shall not be wounded. Now, I know Ruckman teaches this, and I, I believe he's right, that in the resurrection body, you will not have blood. Now, if that was true, and I believe it is, you could fall on a sword, it wouldn't do a thing to you. Now, is that true of any other army that's ever existed? No. No. It's interesting, I have a video about guns and ammunition and things, and they, they actually demonstrate bulletproof vests, ballistic vests. And the one guy, he's standing like three feet away from the other guy, and he shoots him with a three oh eight. Boom, you know, and, and some of the material kind of goes, and the guy's fine. That's amazing. Another guy has a forty four Magnum, bang, you know, he actually pulls the trigger and boom, and, and he's fine. Now, would that work if they were hit by a sword? No. 
There is no such thing as armor of any kind that would be able to take falling on a sword and not kill the person that's inside the armor. I don't care what kind of ballistic armor or what kind of metal you have on you. If you fall on a sword, you're going to die. Okay? Just plain and simple. So what's this, what's this army here? This isn't a, a army of people, of human beings. This is a glorified army of immortal saints, basically. Okay, this is, this, is, this is not anything that's happened in the past or that some human army is going to fulfill. That's important to understand because people will try to spiritualize this. It's not to be spiritualized. Look at verse 9. They shall run to and fro in the city... They shall run upon the wall, they shall climb up upon the houses, they shall enter in at the windows like a thief. Why? Got to gather people up. Gather them up. Take the people to judgment. Now, isn't it interesting that that some of the the patriot thing? Oh, you don't. They, they, it's it's wrong. You don't have a right to be entering into houses and stuff and door to door seizures. Well, I agree with that with the human government, but guess what? When Jesus Christ is here, it's going to be done. No opinions. You know, who cares? I mean, well, you don't have a right to do that. Tough. We're coming in. <laughs> you know? The first one did it too, though. What's that? The Antichrist army oh, yeah. will do it to us. Oh, yeah. The Antichrist army will do it. You know? But it's not going to be in truth and righteousness that they do it. It will be when we do it. Verse 10, the earth shall quake before them and heaven shall, tr and the, he the heavens shall tremble. The sun and the moon shall be dark and the stars shall withdraw their shining. Read all the accounts, Matthew 24, Mark 13. Read the accounts of the second coming of Jesus Christ. You'll see that. The sun and the moon being dark, stars, stars withdrawing their shining. That's the event there. Look at verse 11. And the Lord shall utter his voice before his army. For his camp is very great, for he is strong that executeth his word. For the day of the Lord is great and very terrible, and who can abide it? Man, am I looking forward to that. Justice, righteousness, righteousness is going to be fulfilled on this earth. There's not going to be any kind of, well, you know, no, the majority feels that, no. The Lord Jesus Christ will give laws and we will carry it out. Period. No voting. No, well, we need a second opinion. Maybe we ought to elect him out of office. Uh-uh. <laughs> Jesus Christ in there. Yeah. Okay. Um, I'm just going to read some scriptures here. We aren't going to turn to them for sake of time. Uh, Psalm chapter 2, verse 9. Thou shalt break them with a rod of iron. Thou shalt dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. Revelation 2, 27. And he shall rule them with a rod of iron as the vessels of a potter shall they be broken to shivers even as i received of my father uh, revelation 12 5 and she brought forth a man child who was to rule all nations with a rod of iron and her child was caught up unto god and to his throne revelation 19 15 and out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword that with it he should smite the nations and he shall rule them with a rod of iron, and he treadeth the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. Okay, now we're going to go to Zechariah chapter 13. Two more places to turn, then we're done. Zechariah chapter 13. You say, okay, we see that, you know, you have Jesus Christ destroying the Antichrist, destroying his army, and then we see that, you know, the nations are, he, we go out, we gather the nations together for judgment. But then what's it going to be like in the millennial kingdom? You know, at that point then, is it just this loving, peaceful thing? Well, let's look at that. Revelation chapter 13, verses 1 through 5. It says here, In that day there shall be a fountain open to the house of David for, and to the inhabitants of Jerusalem for sin and for uncleanness. And it shall come to pass in that day, saith the Lord of hosts, that I will cut off the names of the idols out of the land, and they shall no more be remembered. <laughs> I like that too. Uh, there will be no Buddhists. There will be no Muslims. There will be no Catholics. 
Uh, and also I will cause the prophets and the unclean spirit to pass out of the land. Verse 3, And it shall come to pass that when any shall yet prophesy, then his father and his mother that begat him shall say unto him, Thou shalt not live, for thou speakest lies in the name of the Lord, and his father and his mother that begat him shall thrust him through when he prophesieth. Oh, it will be a time of peace. Well, it will be as long as you follow Jesus Christ. Okay? But the death penalty is enforced by someone's parents. Now, what does it take to have that kind of rule? Military dictatorship. Jesus Christ, King of Kings, Lord of Lords, <clears throat> dictating exactly what happens. It's going to be tough. Verse 4, And it shall come to pass in that day that the prophets shall be ashamed every one of his vision when he hath prophesied, neither shall they wear a rough garment to deceive, but he shall say, I am no prophet, I am an husbandman, for man taught me to keep cattle from my youth. There will be no televangelists. <laughs> Okay, they're going to be out farming. Right, there's not going to be a need for prophecy. Okay, uh, just a couple things here I want to say before we turn to the last verse that we're going to look at. Uh, the millennial kingdom is coming. And that's when everything is going to be set straight. Right now we all have that desire within us to see justice, to see judgment, righteousness. You're never going to see it with human government. That's why there is no way I would ever be anything but premillennial in my beliefs. Jesus Christ is going to rule and reign from Jerusalem for the thousand years. Okay? And at that point, it's going to go down to one religion. You just read there, he cuts off the idols. They're, never even, they're not even remembered anymore. One religion. One vote. Who cares what anybody else thinks? What does Jesus Christ say? Now, you can't have that among people. There, you can never have a human ruler that has that kind of authority. Whenever you do, it just ends up in disaster. And it doesn't even last that long either, by the way. Um, one election at the beginning of the millennium. And nobody actually votes. So, <laughs> you know, Jesus Christ is set up on the throne, and that's it. Uh, absolute monarchy under Jesus Christ. One army. Okay? Us, if you're saved, you're going to be part of that army that enforces his laws. Um, I've, I've done some study on a guy, and you know I, he certainly was not a perfect man, but uh, one of my heroes is uh, Oliver Cromwell. Oliver Cromwell was a member of the British Parliament right after the King James Bible was finished, back in 1611. I think about 1615 or so is when he was in and basically you had King James the first was a good man. Okay? And he passed a lot of good laws and everything. He authorized translation of the King James Bible. And as it typically goes, you read through the Old Testament, you have a good king and his son turns out to be rotten. And that's how it happened with King James. King Charles the first came along after King James and he King James passed a law that no future king or queen could be Catholic. And so what's his son do? He marries a Catholic, <laughs> the princess of France. She's Catholic. And now you have a Catholic queen. And she started making trouble. Long story short, the members of parliament rose up against the king and the royalists. And they had a civil war. And it's very interesting because, in a way... If you want to see a type of what Jesus Christ is going to do, Oliver Cromwell is about as close as you can get to that. Okay? Because you had these people rising up against the system there, against this, this corrupt monarch, and they basically, you know, fought against him, and uh, they eventually overthrew him, and they said to Cromwell, We want to make you king. And he made a statement which is actually engraved on Cromwell's grave. He said, Christ, not man, is king. He would not take the title king. He said, that's wrong. I don't want to be king. They called him the Lord Protector, basically. And he did some amazing things. And I'll tell you what, 
he didn't live very long after he had been made Lord Protector. But if he had, he might have destroyed the Catholic Church. I mean, he drove them out of, he was driving them out of countries. He'd go into Ireland. He drove them almost completely out of Ireland. I mean, he just, he was something else. And it's interesting because he, at first, the parliamentary forces were not that strong. And then they made, they, they called it the New Model Army. And boy, that military, under Cromwell's command, they never lost one battle. And it's kind of strange in a way because it's like, right now, we do have strength as Christians. We do influence legislation. We do have some, some power. That's why a lot of politicians here in America act like they're Christians, you know. But we're not that strong yet. But when we go to be with the Lord during the tribulation time period and we come back down, we will be the new model army. And we will not lose one battle from that day forward. And what we're going to set up is a military dictatorship run by Jesus Christ. Amen. And Oliver Cromwell is going to be one of us, by the way. <laughs> you know, he'll be down here and he isn't going to, I think I should be the ruler. I don't think there's, huh? He's going to be with the rest of us saying, thou art worthy to the Lord Jesus Christ. I can't wait for that day. I'll tell you what. One more verse of scripture and then we're, then we're done for this morning. Revelation chapter 10. Here we see another verse which would be real good for the anybody who's not premillennial. And this is a real good verse too for atheists. Revelation chapter 10 verse 7. But in the days of the voice of the seventh angel, when he shall begin to sound, the mystery of God should be finished, as he hath declared to his servants the prophets. When Jesus Christ comes back, there will no longer be a mystery of God. There will no longer be, well, how can you really prove God exists? Can you really, you know, eh, the mystery's over. You'll see him. Amen. He will rule and reign on this earth in righteousness and the peace that he sets up will be based on truth and justice. There will be no more perversion, more false systems of belief. It's all going to be finished. And I think that this time period is coming very, very soon, by the way. You can see it. So, yes, there is a military dictatorship coming that will be ruled by Satan, essentially. The dragon, his power, his authority. He'll give it to the Antichrist. And I believe eventually that the Antichrist is going to be Satan in the flesh. You know, which another big study. That's coming. And it's going to be bad. And your only chance of making it out of that, actually, but even, even making it in the lead up to this thing, it's not going to happen after the rapture. It's being built right now. Okay, that... that structure is being built our own president back in 1961 warned about this thing he saw it being formed your only chance of getting out of that is through faith in jesus christ after this military dictatorship though this is not the one that that ends everything after that one is the one that jesus christ will set up you better make sure that you're part of it okay and I believe everybody here is this morning, but uh, for, for those of you who are listening, man, I would not want to be facing the army that comes back with Jesus Christ someday. You say, oh, I, I need to see proof. You know, I need to see proof. You'll see proof. <laughs> believe me. If you're an atheist and you, and you stumble across this message, you're going to see proof. More proof than you want. So that's it for this morning. Thank you for listening. Let the elders that rule well be counted worthy of double honor, especially they who labor in the word and doctrine. For the scripture saith, Thou shalt not muzzle the ox that treadeth out the corn, and the laborer is worthy of his reward. If these sermons or videos have been a blessing to you, please help us to continue this work by supporting this ministry. You can send a check payable to Brian Denlinger to King James Video Ministries, P.O. Box 300, Bradford, PA, 16701. Or you can donate online through PayPal at our website, www.kingjamesvideoministries.com. 
Thank you, and may the Lord Jesus Christ bless you.